Hey, hey, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Welcome back with another Red Pill Religion podcast, Red Pill Religion, where we are dedicated to the proposition, amongst other things, that belief in the supernatural is and the transcendent is normal, healthy, rational, and evidence-based. It's also good for children and adults, men and women alike. So please support our work on redpillreligion.com. Still working on that website, so it'll redirect you to escapingatheism.com, where we do take your uh, donations uh, through BitPal, PayCoin, and Maker Support, hopefully coming very soon. Uh, please give us a like. Please give us a subscribe. Please tell your friends or enemies. Also, uh, tonight we've actually got a double header. After we're done here, uh, uh, looking at a video by Ali43, uh, Andrew Chatelites will be uh, around 9 p.m. Eastern. We'll be bringing in a group uh, to talk about ethics and the issue of ethics and how you do ethics, uh, especially in a theist versus non-theist or atheist worldview. So be sure to check them out. I'm sure Andrew and probably Philosophy Tiger and Philo Monty, I think, will be in on that. But we'll see. Good luck for them. All right. So today, okay. So today, joining me for this escaping and deflating and escaping atheism is Mr. Deflating Atheism. How you doing? Hey, hey, I'm doing all right. Everybody, please be sure to go over to his uh, channel and like and subscribe. And since he now actually officially has more subscribers somehow than Red Pill Religion, if you're on Red, on Deflating Atheism, please come over here and to subscribe to Red Pill Religion. I'm yeah. jealous. Um. Uh, also, uh, uh, joining us is our friend who has his own new channel that he's still working on, White Engine. Say hi, Engine. Ciao. And he has a female type person with him. <laughs> hi. And, <laughs> and the pretty lady's name is Liz. How you doing, Liz? Doing good. Doing good. All right, excellent, Liz. You ever you, you like you you like looking at atheist videos? <laughs> <laughs> Still trying to get like a better understanding of everything. Oh, uh, that's so fair enough. Cool. That's fair enough. Yeah, you told um, me how to. <laughs> The video we're doing today is actually one of the, and, and we're not going to be real mean to this guy because I don't see a need to be super mean to him. Um, unlike a whole lot of YouTube atheists, he's just telling his personal story. Uh, it's called How I Gave Up Religion. Huh? Well, that kind of just endearing, actually. I, I mean, yeah, we, we, we kind of savage a lot of people, but just a guy uh, just open. There's something kind of endearing about a guy opening his heart and just telling his story. No matter how kind yeah. of male his epiphanies may be, but you know, I thought I thought it was something different. Yeah, and forty three alley does not appear to be a, what I usually call a professional atheist, or at least not much of one. In fact, he doesn't seem to have been doing many videos the last few years. This is an older one. Um, yes. and this was probably this was when the whole atheist thing was first getting super popular, um, and yeah. I think there were a lot of because people like cresting. him at the time, huh? As it was cresting, two thousand ten. I mean, yeah. I would think, yeah, as it was cresting, and even, no, I don't know, it was pretty bad around 2012, 2013, and so, but it, it had, in any case, um, yeah, this is obviously not a guy who got too deep into the cult network. A lot of the professionals are in a cult network. It looks to me like he just got singed by him, and I would say he's just another one of those guys who grew up with a, without a very good uh, education, and uh, especially on religious matters, and so he gave up in frustration. I, I, I can actually understand that. Heck, I was an atheist for so long. Mm -hmm. So, okay, why don't we just go ahead and, and bust into this, uh, this video. We'll probably go a minute or so at a time, and if anybody needs me to stop, yell stop really loud so I hear you, but otherwise I'll probably let him go roughly a minute at a shot, and let's see what we get. Hey, everyone. This is 43 Alley. And this is my story of how I broke free from religion. And it starts when I was a boy. I grew up in rural Appalachia in the South, where you can't drive two blocks without coming across two or three churches. And I had teachers push evolution to the end of the curriculum and then not teach it when there wasn't time at the end of the semester. In elementary school, which was a public school, we had missionaries once a week, which meant that this 90-year-old woman came in and she played church songs and told Bible stories for an hour. The only student who didn't have to go was the only Catholic student who went to my school. And all the other Baptists said, she's going to hell. I always knew in the back of my mind, something wasn't right about that. There were all these other denominations out there, and they all thought the other ones were going to hell. So what did that mean for somebody who worshipped a different God? 
All right, that's about a minute. Maybe we'll look yeah. back. Um, uh, I just wanted to have, first give away, no offense, because I love people from that part of the country, but he grew up in Appalachia. All right. Um, uh, and he and, and I got me some Baptist friends, but he grew up Baptist. And so, to be honest, uh, 43 Alley, uh, you don't have a very good religious education. I'm sorry, but you don't. Um, and, and, and that's OK. Hey, but one of the things he just said that, and everybody, anybody else feel free to jump in. You've already made an error. Um, uh, by the way, I'm Catholic, so thanks for uh, sticking up for me. Um, not everybody here is Catholic. Um, but uh, I got Baptist friends. Uh, I got uh, Anglican friends. I got Mennonite friends. I got friends of all a bunch of different denominations. And we don't all think everybody else is going to hell. Yes. That is a belief that is very common in certain Baptist and what I would call Baptist type churches. Um, that is a common belief among uh, some Catholics, although if you really dig into it, you'll find that uh, Catholic teaching is you teach that all non-Catholics are going to hell. That is actually a heresy. Yes. Um, yes. The way we, we see it is actually complicated. And to a certain extent, it's like we don't ultimately know. Um, so it, it is not true. You will find some strains of Christians who will insist they're the only ones and everybody else is going to hell or all the Catholics are going to hell. That's actually common in Baptist uh, circles. Um, but not all Baptists think that way at all. Uh, and, you know, I just told you Catholics. So, uh, and, uh, you know, no, most denominations don't actually see it that way. So that's an error on your part, although I'm sure you know some Baptists and some other Bible thumpers who do think that way. Um, and, but, again, he just needs to learn more. What do you guys get out of that? You said it. I mean, I mean, I didn't really have a whole lot to add to that other than that. No, not every uh, Christian denomination believes that the believers of every other denomination are going to hell. Yeah. And in fact, I would have to think that that's a that's a, that's probably even something that uh, like the Baptist kids were probably doing to the Catholic to tease him or her. Um, and you, you might see the same thing at a Catholic school, by the way, because yeah, well, kind of little it, kids will. Little kids will seize upon anything to to ostracize another kid. So I mean, yeah, religion could be one thing. I mean, it could it could be anything. Also, uh, do you want to make note of the fact uh, he didn't actually say that much when we said that there are just like all these churches? I find that like a lot of atheists just feel very put upon just by the mere presence of religion in their lives, where there are like churches and billboards and stuff. And so it really, I think, speaks to a very uh, kind of anti-theist uh, kind of impulse on their part that they that well, they, they just don't like the fact that other people can can express their religion. All right, so let's give it to him another way, though. I uh, mean, he's got. I mean, we may want to go further into this because he does start talking about hell later. I, I, I do. I, I do find a certain kind of religious person very who's very pushy. Uh, quite intrusive and annoying, and you do find those types down in Bible Belt country, um, and they can be really annoying. Uh, I, I, so I get that. Um, but yeah, let's see what else he's got to say here. Unless you guys got anything to add, let's let's see. I would we... say there's no one right denomination. Well, uh, okay, uh, and that's that. Yeah, but and much more to the point. And you're 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 not even technically a Christian, right? Well, I am a Christian in the sense that I accept Christ as my Savior, but I'm a secular theist as a way to the slap in the face to those who think, who try to synchronize atheism with secularism, and that I hold that various faiths and beliefs hold truth to them, some big, other small. Fair enough, fair enough. Well, Catholics think the same thing, but not quite. But anyway, let's go ahead and see what we, uh, well, give me about another minute here. Now look, I like my pediatrician, but what did that mean for him? I didn't want to think about it. You know, it's a lot like Santa Claus. I remember one weekend driving with my dad to deliver a bunch of baseball equipment to about uh, 10 or 15 different houses. My dad was literally president, and we got in the shipment of bats and gloves and balls and something you know, for all these different coaches and teams. As we were driving around, I remember him saying, we're like Santa Claus, delivering presents. And I thought, wow, you know, we're only taking stuff to see houses, and it's taking all day. 
And then I thought, wait a minute, wait, wait, wait. I have 30 kids in my class. There are two other classes in my grade. That's 90 houses. There's other grades in my school. There's other schools, other counties, states, countries, continents. Dad? How does Santa get gifts to billions of kids in one night? Oh, God. Oh. Santa. Are we stopping it there? No, I'm going to let him finish this. On Magic. <laughs> more about it. How is it possible to hold all those toys in that one single play? Okay, we're on Santa now. I know what's coming up next is Noah's Ark. Now, I'm not, actually, you're laughing, but... I'm going to back it up for you grow up without, you know, basically. Look, uh, one of the things I would want to point out to him is, is, is that he lear if he learned more traditional theology, yes, like from Catholics, or just to be honest, from even like Lutherans or Methodists, uh, uh, he doesn't have. I like when they pull that. He doesn't have like a very rational. That analogy. It's like being a child. It's like Santa Claus. Well, that's what I did in my in my Coach Red Pill video. As soon as, soon as he mentioned Santa Claus, it's like, okay, I know, I know how I know which direction this is going. You know. Oh uh, yeah. Yeah. I, here's the thing, and is here's the thing I would want to point out to him, and I will. Uh, I've mentioned this book before, but I might as well uh, bring it up again. It's called Born, Born Believers. And I'll, I'll say a couple of things about Santa Claus. The book is called Born Believers, The Science of Children's Belief by Jared Barrett. Um, and uh, it's actually a, a, a very scientific book, fully you know, peer-reviewed research. And uh, here's a few things I can tell you about Santa Claus. Uh, first off, uh, uh, most children can distinguish Santa from uh, and imaginary friends and monsters under the bed from God very easily. Um, uh, now, maybe he grew up in a religious tradition, and I know this type of kind of more fundamentalist, it's all Jesus, 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 Jesus. So you find yourself wondering if you believe in this guy, Jesus. Um, because again, the, the education's not good. You got people of the land in Appalachia who have been, you know, doing their basic Bible reading for hundreds of years a certain way, um, not highly educated. I'm not being insulting, by the way, it's because education can be overrated, okay? But I mean, in this area, basic theology is what I would uh, have him learn because you have to have, when you, when you start intellectually questioning like this, Jesus may not make a whole lot of sense to you unless the idea of God in the first place makes sense to you. You know what I'm saying, guys? I, you know, yeah. the idea that there is some intelligence running everything is the first step to getting somewhere. Go ahead. Like in a, like a kindergarten when I went to, like a, there are more kids that recognize Ronald McDonald more than Jesus. Well, and I'm not even sure I'm, I'm mad about that because, uh, frankly, a lot of people have a cartoon idea of Jesus I can't stand anyway. You know, and that, that includes some of the fundamentalists. And... You know, they're, they're, especially they are, the, huh? especially the fake white Jesus that's so prevalent in popular culture. The what? You, know, you have to be able to dissociate those things, just as you have to be able to dissociate, you know, uh, Da Vinci's uh, or Michelangelo's, you know, image of God from from the timeless, transcendent God of the monotheist faiths. I mean, yeah, you have to understand that there are certain liberties that are taken in those depictions. Yeah, Let me that's just, just symbolism. Yeah, maybe, let me make sure that Axel at least gets to hear this at least once for someone who wants to explain it to him. The idea of Christianity is not that some guy ultra powerful called Jesus came and killed and got himself killed. <laughs> you know what? Let's look at a little more of his video. But the Santa Claus comparison doesn't work unless you think Jesus is just a guy and you got no good idea of what God would be like in the first place. The Christian idea is that God chose to take human form. That's that's an important right. You know, that's who Jesus Christ supposedly is. God, who already existed, uh, decided to take human form. God doesn't have a body naturally, just so you know. But since he made everything, he could make himself one, and that's what Christians think Jesus is. And there's lots of people who believe in God, by the way, who don't believe in Jesus. But let's, I don't know, 
Yeah, well, yeah. that's why we say the atheists. And I mean, yes, there are atheists who were one day walking down a city street and heard a church choir or something and walked into the church and then immediately fell to their new knees. And so I don't trivialize those kind of experiences at all. But when when I have the typical atheist who, who, who starts saying, well, why this religion rather than that? My kind of stock response is just assume every religion is wrong. Just first answer the question of does God exist? Does God make sense? Then once you've answered that question, I think if you answer it honestly, you'll answer in the affirmative. Then you say, okay, well, is there any religion uh, whose teachings are, are kind of coherent given the existence of God and given my you know, knowledge of the world and, and, and whatnot? So yeah, and that, I, just, and that, what's that? And that uh, Bible made me an atheist meme. Like, well, I guess that throws deism out the window, right? Yeah, yeah, it does. Right. Yeah. It does. I, I will say I have real sympathy for the Bible made me an atheist people. I do um, to some extent, uh, but uh, only to some extent, because really uh, find the smart people who can explain it to you better is what I would say uh, so that you at least understand it. But I mean, yeah, I, I, I actually I'll say that when I was an atheist, when I did read the book, I found it um, un convincing when i read the bible as an atheist and i wasn't even being i mean i don't know emotion plays into all that but really i just didn't see why you'd see there was a god so i found the bible unconvincing and 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 god did seem pretty nasty sometimes and arbitrary and weird um well let's go on let's look at a little more of his video because uh, i'll explain later why it seems a lot less arbitrary and weird now I mean, Toys R Us needs a whole building, and that's just toys for my town. Why does Santa Claus not get the poor kids very much? But then, see, I get back to school, and all the other kids who believe in Santa Claus, they reinforce the fact that he does exist. And because a lot of other kids believed it, hey, it must be true. And then as I got older... Okay, I'm going to object right there, because uh, he's a little more about Santa. It, it is observable in my memory and that of others that, uh, including some, you know, scientists, you know, kid psychologists who've looked at child, uh, this issue. It is normal for children to start questioning the existence of Santa Claus at a fairly early age. And uh, while some of them get crushed uh, when they find out there's no Santa, it's actually pretty rare to be crushed to find out there's no Santa because most kids actually start questioning at a fairly early age and start to figure out that there's a game afoot mm. and they figure it out on their own or often the other kids will tell them and then they'll go back and forth arguing, is there a Santa or not? Oh yes, there really is. And then they'll, t they'll tell another kid, oh, I'm not sure. Oh no, it's my dad. That, that I mean, <clears throat> I'm sorry. I doubt, I really want to know if all the kids in his school were so unquestioningly that those conversations, those conversations I remember having in like first grade. Yeah. I mean, what is there really a Santa? And you always had the older kids or the supposed mean kid who would be grinning at you and giving you the bad news that there's no Santa and you'd have the other ones trying. Yeah. Uh, kid who would sell you firecrackers. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So this is a little, it's it's a little lame. Were, were the kids there in Appalachia really that? Not like the kids when I grew up in Chicago or Texas? Uh, like gotta, same, same with the Easter Bunny. Yeah, exactly well, the same with the Easter Bunny. Um, very few children wind up crushed beyond belief when they find out there's no Easter Bunny. Most kids start to figure out there's a game going on and the, the adults and the older kids are in on it as they age. Well, so, it was like a, a valuable exercise for the kids of just figuring out how the world works and, you know, saying that maybe the things that people say aren't always uh, uh, the truth and that could, that could be useful. I have no memory of ever believing in Santa Claus, but I, I do recall uh, believing in the Easter Bunny to a, to a protracted age. I, I, I do understand kids who grew up in abusive, and I'm not saying he did. I do understand uh, the kids like myself and many others I've talked to who grew up in really abusive, chaotic environments felt real betrayed by the whole Santa thing, but that's a kind of, cause he's going to be a kid dealing with a lot of betrayal and a lot of people lying to him. So he's just going to add Santa on as another lie. And I actually think that's why they out sometimes add God on as another lie. But 
And I'm not saying that's him. Money and Tooth Fairy also. Yeah, really. How how were you really crushed? I think there was no Tooth Fairy uh, at all. I, I, I was like, no, really. <laughs> it's Santa <laughs> syndrome. Dad's been, putting, you, Dad's been putting the money under my pillow. Oh, you <laughs> bastards! My world is ruined. Yeah, no. Atheists are just uh, little kids who never got over learning that Santa Claus doesn't exist. That Santa I syndrome. Think, yeah, I do think the abuse connection plays into this because, well, we'll so let's just keep going. I'm not saying him, but for a lot of those atheists, they got. If you grew up in an abusive environment where you were constantly being lied to by adults, then yeah, I could see how you'd get bitter about something like Santa or God. Oh, but technically, there. Technically, there was a Santa Claus like back in the day, Saint yeah, Nicholas. Saint Nicholas. Well, yes, he, he, punch, he, put, yeah. he puts the, 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 the heretic Arius in the face at the at the yeah, council of Nicaea. Yeah, that's actually <laughs> that's actually not the Santa Claus. It's the, the actual the Santa Claus that uh, the Saint Nicholas that Santa Claus is based on is Saint Nicholas from uh, was he Dutch? I think he's a much later figure. Um, based he on what he based on what he did in his uh, village at night before Christmas. Um, was it? I would. I didn't even know it went that deep. I, I thought he had some background in working with children or whatever. But the original Saint Nicholas didn't run around delivering presents. I don't think um, something among those lines. Yeah, yeah. Um, he's evolved from then. All right, let's just keep going. The religious stuff started to bother me. Why is religion geographical? You can point to a country on the map, and you know right away what their religion is. No, you don't. It me that if the universe is so freaking big. And there's one God who did it all. And he's got this one little favorite speck of dust that's floating out there in one little minuscule galaxy. You think that they would all follow him? Okay, uh, we can stop there. He's now he's getting to the now again. I'm gonna again, I'm cutting him some slack because I don't, don't think he's one of these indoctrinated goofs with the talking points that so many of them have. But uh, they do use that. That glass half empty, the universe is 99.999% uninhabitable. But we are far yeah. from the only world that has God's attention, most likely. Yeah. Let's, let, let's, let, let's mention something about our religion's spread. The fact that it's more popular in a geographical area doesn't prove anything at all. Um, really, what, what significance does the fact that you have different religions in different areas uh, there is religious strife to explain some of that. And by the way, before you accuse religious people of causing violence, just look at what atheists and secularists have done um, in the name of scientific rationalism and progress, um, not just communists either, but fascists as well. Uh, you know, it's more, so anyway, religious conflict will be part of it. And atheism would be, an, or, and secularism is a religion, by the way. Don't care if you believe that or not, it is. And, uh, you know, religions have to spread by word of mouth. Uh, and by the way, if you're in a sophisticated religion, like, say, Catholic, just as one example, um, right. we know truths in other religions. That's, that's actually in the catechism of the, catech of the Catholic Church. You can go read it. There are, are spiritual truths and even spiritual gifts in other religions that are good and true and of God doesn't mean we embrace everything in those other religions. We just know that this is true of other religions. Um, so I don't know. Did we did we ha handle this geography question well enough? I mean, well, well I, I think first off, uh, it should be noted that there are converts to every religion in in every geographical place on the earth. And, that's right. Uh, you will. It's very easy to find geographical concentrations of atheists. You will, you will yeah. find great uh, concentrations of atheists in the Pacific Northwest, in the United Kingdom, in Northern Europe. So if you're going to use a geographical concentration as a means for invalidating all religion, you could just invalidate atheism by the same standard. Yeah, in fact, I would point out again what, you, what you've got when you have those maps showing the, the, the prevalence of religion is you've got proof that it's natural and normal for people to be spiritual. And so that some spiritual tradition will always be there. And by the way, when the the uh, when when the spiritual tradition is is hardcore secularism, you get th stuff like China. Yeah, where uh, where Christianity, Christianity is blossoming. By the way, it's blossoming even though it's under serious persecution. You can't just say that they learn it from their moms. Okay, and, and uh, another thing I, I think uh, is kind of important to note is uh, <laughs> geez, I just blanked out there. 
I just blanked well, out. In Africa too. Uh, <laughs> sub sub Saharan Africa uh, is exploding with Christianity yes. uh, to un un unprecedented, unhistorical levels. Um, much of the continent is now like 90% Christian, and they are mostly Catholics and Anglicans. Um, but th they'll say although, that's, although, that's although the cause a, of the problem. Growing, uh, growing Pentecostalists, uh, and I got mis mixed views of Pentecostalism, but it's there. Um, I'm sorry, what were you going to say? They'll say that that's the cause of the problems over there. That the Christianity is the cause. Yeah, well, that is a frequent atheist bigot claim. It's not true. Uh, Muslims uh, are a problem there too, but uh, uh, you know, and friction with Muslims is a problem. But also, secular globalist institutions are a huge cause of much of, much of that. Um, you also, so anyway, uh, they would, the atheists, of course, with their with their typical uh, uh, chauvinism, will say, "Well, those are those are shithole countries, <laughs> essentially." And so that's why Christianity takes root there. And of course, uh, in their higher regard are the Northern European, like the Scandinavian countries, where there's a lot of secularism. And so they'll take, they'll take that as proof of, of just uh, the fact that education will not begets uh, uh, atheism or agnosticism. But by the, same, by the same token, their other talking point is that the, uh, the internet is killing religion, that the, the internet is where religion goes to die, and that the free flow of information is putting an end to religion or is putting an end to Christianity. Well, how, do you, how, does, that, uh, how does that square with China or Africa? Are these, do these people have less access to, to uh, information? Is that why Christianity is flourishing there? So it, it completely just doesn't make sense. He'll probably, they, don't, they do have Well, a, the internet is the biggest propaganda machine known to man. Oh, no, it definitely is the biggest vector for atheist propaganda. You you will not get any any debate there. It's also the biggest vector for conspiracy theories like 9-11 trutherism or flat eartherism. It's, uh, oh, it, yeah. Yeah, and, and, well, and I will say atheists had money and clout and organizations and actually went out specifically to bully Christians off the internet. And we got evidence of that if you ever want to hear yes. it. Um, uh, no one in the atheist community likes talking about the fact that they really did go out there to specifically psychologically terrorize, deplatform, and otherwise marginalize. Yeah. Did you say harass something like that? Yeah, hmm? Harass and blackmail. Harass and blackmail. Yep, yep, yep. Um, but in any case, all right, well, we should probably keep going, well, but, but we didn't I get to a say, I, argument here. Mm -hmm. huh? I just also want to say that uh, uh, what he brushed upon, he didn't really make it explicit, but the whole uh, atheist talking point that if God existed, everyone on the earth would be one religion, that's just a non sequitur. The conclusion yeah, that follows the premise. We, we, so, uh, uh, that's just, that's your microphone if, if, if you're talking over there. Yeah, yeah. Try muting that mic. Be chatting. Uh, we can't hear you. Um, okay. Uh, and he does go into this whole seems to me argument of, of of the size of the universe. So let me just let me just point a few things out to him. First, within a decent, within a sensible, let's say, a, for example, a Thomist Christian worldview. Um, it's entirely plausible that the universe is teeming with other life and other civilizations. It, it would not be impossible. It would not be a challenge to us. Um, we would also expect those other beings to have figured out that there has to be a God. Um, that, that, because there's plenty of evidence that there has to be a God. Um, Jesus or no. And second, there's actually reasons to question this. For example, it's all, it's, it seems more possible, at least within current science, with what we know, that there is no other life in the universe. Um, I that's wouldn't go that far. Huh? I no. wouldn't go that far. Well, if you look, if you, <laughs> I've looked at the, I've looked at the data, and, and, and the last time I looked, the consensus view was just, no, it's, it's, we're looking for evidence of life elsewhere, and a lot of people want to find it, um, but right there now, are over, well, there's there over a three, radio silence from them, yes. I, there let are me over, just, over 300 there's, billion stars in just our galaxy alone. And it said that on average, around two of every star's planet is habitable for life. Yeah, so, and I don't uh, want to go Googling it now because I don't want to, you know, derail on this, but I'll just, okay. It, it, there is people of your opinion. Uh, there is another 
opinion of at least equal weight, which has looked at it statistically and looked at the odds of life developing just here are so astronomically low um, that it's like less than one in, in the total number of atoms in the universe uh, that life would develop anywhere at all, at least if it does so under a random chance. And there's a lot of scientists, not just creationists, but quite even atheist scientists say, yeah, that math makes sense. So it's an open debate at least. And I, for, like I said, from a Christian perspective, it works either way. Because really, it's totally unthreatening if there are other civilizations out there, really. Um, but if, if but there's a lot of science that says, no, there won't be any. Um, it's up to you to decide what you believe there. Um, but if there isn't any, then it would make sense that the universe was designed for us. And I can give you a couple of other things in science to at least chew on. Um, if you look at something called uh, the geomet the universal, ge I can't remember what the full phrase is, but the geometric mean yeah. uh, of humans um, from the, from the from the smallest particle that we can measure, from the small, smallest particle that we know of to the outer limits of the universe, we are exactly geometrically in the middle. Human beings are. Hmm. And that is, uh, that is scientifically and philosophically interesting, to say the least. We're right in the middle, uh, scale-wise. Um, another thing to look into is something called the digital physics theory of the universe, um, and quantum physics generally, but especially digital physics. Um, because the digital physics theory of the universe, which even Neil Tyson says he believes in, that he thinks is true, uh, posits that uh, nothing in the universe is is actually physically there unless it's being observed. That it literally disappears when it's not being observed. Physically, it disappears. Information on it is stored in quantum space. I think they call it uh, N space. Um, uh, no, Hil Hil Hilbert space. Um, and. So, like, literally, it's like we're in a video game, and the stuff we observe is loaded when we go to where that stuff is. And then when we leave, it disappears, like we're in a big video game. Now, I know that sounds creepy and weird, although everybody's have always imagined something like that might be true. Everybody's always imagined that, I know. At least once or twice, everybody has. Like, the stuff that's behind my head disappear when I'm not there is you know is anything actually in those empty houses or is it and 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 at least under digital physics and a lot of other things in quantum me mechanics the answer is yeah if nobody can observe it it's not there so if that theory is true and a lot of scientists think it's true uh, then you know looking at a, a galaxy far far away would be like we're in the Legend of Zelda and we look up in the sky, they're in Skyrim, or, or, or Skyrim, another example, whatever, any video yeah, game you want. It's being rendered for us because we're looking at it. But there and has to be all observing. Find, huh? There has to be some all observing intelligence. That's correct. Digital physics uh, is, it says there has to be one. You can't be in a simulation without a simulator that's running it. And it can't be a dumb simulator that just kind of randomly does that. Um, so, Mikio Kaku is starting to figure it out. He may be oh, becoming a closeted deist. I'm not really sure, but oh, he, pretty he, much, said that, said he, pretty much he said that in the future, what we call chance won't make sense anymore. Yeah, if you look, in fact, if you look on the high end of physics, you're going to find most contemporary living Nobel laureates in physics are Christians. Uh, and other religions are well represented. And it's not by accident. Yeah actually, because we don't have time today, but if he'd ever want to have the conversation, and I'll invite him now, I'll explain to him why a classical, educated, orthodox Christian worldview actually is what makes all this possible in the first place, all this science that we do. Um, and that's why Christian scientists tend to be the best scientists. Well, I, I, right. say, I, just, I was just thinking about this today. I, I feel I feel it's kind of a, a, a clusterfuck at this point. But uh, uh, yeah, sixty-five percent of Nobel laureates in physics are Christians. But of all the uh, of all the uh, new atheist heavy hitters who come out to tell us that that science is opposed to religion, Sean Carroll, Richard Dawkins, uh, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, uh, you know Sam Harris, all of them. There is not a single Nobel Prize among all of them. So no. where, where did they get off telling other scientists what they must believe in the in these uh, doctrinal metaphysical claims? that the natural world is all that exists. Because right. they said so. 
Yeah. They said so. The, the, the closest they've got to a real jock scientist is Stephen Hawking. And the truth is he appears to be as much a media celebrity as anything. He still mm -hmm. doesn't have a Nobel. Mm -hmm. And it's not clear that he'll ever have one. Even if he gets one, he'll be unusual in being a, a Nobelist physicist who believes it's the just about crap he believes about religion. It's um, just about the only one among them worth a damn. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. He really is. Even Daniel Dennett's, well, he's done some okay work in AI, but nothing nothing to write home about. Um, it's, it, it's very hard to find an atheist scientist who's a uh, you know, publicly outspoken atheist or anti-religionist or, or touting this anti-religion line like Tyson does. He says he's not an atheist, but he's anti-religion and he's a total bigot about it. Yes. He's obviously sym sympathetic to their cause. Yes. And almost none of these people are actually much of anything as scientists. Um, all right. Let's, let's play a little more of this. Yeah. And then there's dinosaurs. Uh, They're around for hundreds of millions of years. There's no dinosaurs in the Bible, not one. Yeah, I know, in the book of Job, there's a behemoth and a leviathan, but if you have half a brain and you read that, you, you know they're talking about a hippopotamus and an alligator. Look, dinosaurs no. are the earth for millions, hundreds of millions of years. There should be five dinosaurs per page in the Bible. And if you don't want to call them dinosaurs, then you should call them something else and describe specifically what these things are. Plus, there's 65 million years between the last living dinosaur and the first living human. 65 million years. That's a lot. Uh -huh. Bible says the Earth is 6,000 years old. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. Yeah, right there. It doesn't say that anywhere in the Bible. <laughs> I, I mean, like every, everything he said in that in that clip is just like so what? what what does that mean what 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 of what consequence is that fact what if god just wanted us to discover things so he put stuff out there without telling us so that we could have the joy of discovering it i mean how about that well I, leviathan I, and I, uh, behemoth were, i'm sorry go ahead leviathan and uh behemoth were not land creatures but they, they weren't dinosaurs either they were mythical creatures in uh, pagan mythologies I, uh, I we can go back and forth on that because you can have hours of interesting discussions actually on the dating of the universe the, the dinosaurs uh, how to interpret various biblical texts but dude I can tell where this is going it's the whole creation versus evolution thing again he's taken us to so he's a little young earth creationist he's arguing with now, being a guy from Appalachia, I bet he knows a lot of those. Although I would also say, and again, I, I love people down in Appalachia. I'm, I, they have there's good parts and bad parts. Being well educated on theology isn't is, isn't common there, and 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 for that matter, for being that well educated on science isn't that common there. Um, but I can even tell you that even there. Um, not everybody thinks you should read the Bible that literally and try to make the book of Genesis a science text. And there's Christians all over the place who will tell you, don't make the book of Genesis a science text. That's not what it is. I can give you like 10 ways right now, 10 different ways right now to interpret the book of Genesis and, 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 and all that. I, I can point to, you know... Literally, I can point you to books by a, a Jewish scholar who has worked it out that the, the, the book of Genesis is 100% compatible with, uh, and in his view, even seems to predict a 14 billion year old universe and a Big Bang based on how he reads it. And he's a physicist, a really good one, a really accomplished one, and a real serious Jew. Um, and that's just one. There's others. One of my favorites is is that you know the idea that you know humans appeared here uh, as in their current form within the last ten thousand years, um, and you know, you know, so maybe the Bible stories somewhat start there. there, there uh, maybe the whole thing is a legacy. There's so many reasons to read Genesis. Literally, we could talk two hours about it. Yeah, about all the different ways. Not just about any one way. We could talk for more than an hour on different ways of reading Genesis. But what, different what ways you will not Genesis find, that been around, huh? What you will not find in Genesis is anything saying that the that the Earth is six thousand years or that the universe is six thousand years old. 
But but they traced that because due to the genealogies, those yeah, well, there, there was still a medieval monk who used the genealogies of the Bible. But but the even uh, of course that's taking the days of of creation literally, and then he the genealogy is not supposed. It says yes, this guy be, beget this guy, but it doesn't mean that there were not generations in between in any case. Yeah, I think yeah. the people from uh from Adam to Enoch, aka Krishna were just a Paleolithic and Neolithic caveman. I think I'm just going to repeat to the guy that we could talk for an hour on different ways of reading Genesis, and I will be happy to forward that to you. Some of these are thousands of years old, and they question the idea that the Earth would only be 6,000 years old. I, you know, I, you know and many did think it was, it was kind of a literal 6,000, but they were still doing it with spiritual writing and, and going with the symbology of what 6,000 would mean to them and stuff like that. It's, it, nobody thought it was a bloody science text. Well, some did, but you know what I mean. I'm sorry, go ahead. I will give you a hint, though. The Cambrian explosion happened on the fifth day. Oh, okay. Well, that's that's another, because see, there's all kinds of interesting ways they interpret it. it, it it's, People get so lost in this. All right, let's see if we can, hopefully it gets to something more interesting. We've been going almost an hour, so I don't know if we, should we finish? Let's see. 6,000 has happened 766,666 times. It's satanic. Why is the God in the Old Testament such a prick? Why do people back then have to sacrifice bulls? Why does everybody think Noah's Ark such a great story? Okay, Santa Slay again. Oh, God. Um, okay, okay. I thought you liked this guy. I thought you liked him. Oh, well, I, I don't dislike him. I, I, I Again, I'm still being sympathetic, actually, because I remember reading the Bible and thinking God seemed like a real prick. Hey, so uh, what's I your, don't know um, how to get over that hump, exactly. What, um, what's huh? your response to those who think there ain't any position to judge God? Who think that I judge God based on my empathy, and he's a yeah. monster, right? And 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 a, an important fact to say is, well, okay, you as the atheists pretty much are going to believe that we that our entire existence is driven by uh, uh, mindless, uh, random, well, not mindless forces of physics, you know. The the, the 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 quarks uh, or just the, the atoms and molecules, if you will, uh, the result of the laws of probability. We just kind of appeared in the middle of all this noise, right, by random chance that we got lucky to. Why aren't you cursing the horrible, awful laws of physics that cause people to die and suffer and have pain? Why don't you think the universe is hideous and awful in that blind, uncaring universe? where nothing means anything and you get to be snuffed out like a candle. Um, but at the same why, time, is that, the that, universe. why is that a better view for starters? I'm sorry. Sometimes they do show their hand. It's like Richard Dawkins said that the universe is just governed by blind, pitiless indifference. Yeah. And I, I think what happens is they take a lot of their disgust at their own worldviews and project that out on, onto, uh, onto believers. I, th I think they're just frustrated with, with 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 how unsatisfied they are with their own worldview that they just channel that into rage uh, towards believers. Anti-theists have always been a glass half empty kind of people. Yeah, and and let me just point out that um, uh, uh, depending on who you talk to, and by the way, we got people going back all the way back to Origen, you know, almost 2,000 years ago. I can't remember exactly when Origen was, but he, and he's just one example. We even said of the tales, I mean, we're not actually required to believe all the Old Testament tales are literally true. Um, that, 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 all, that these Old Testament tales, they are capable of things like metaphor and simile and spiritual messages. Um, uh, and now Jews will give a different answer on things like uh, Noah's Ark, you know, let's say something cruel in the Bible like Noah's Ark and everybody getting grounded. Um, but the Christian answer is, is that we have to read any such tale, or let's say the tale of uh, when they wiped out the Amalekites. 
um because that's a that's a yeah. stronger more interesting tale some call it a genocide but it was really just a small tribe but i some people um we're supposed to read that through the blood of the the, the slain lamb and the mercy of christ and read the, you know the ultimate message behind that tale without necessarily having to take it literally and that's that's actually a pretty standard christian response to much of the of the cruelty in the Old Testament. Again, a Jew will give a different answer, but they'll have a fairly sophisticated one too, not a dumb one. Um, and you know, even if and and even if you do think all these literal atrocities happen exactly that way at God's command, um, you know, one of the things that's at least part of the Christian message is that you know everybody who came before Christ, you know, gets a shot at salvation. Um, you know, so. Yeah, this, there are hints that men went through. The Israelites went their own way. Uh, yeah, with their own way, what? Like after God gave them the Ten Commandments, and then uh, Moses got pissed off when they made the golden calf and smashed it and rewrote the Ten Commandments, but in a different way. Like only two of the original commandments stood, but the other set of commandments, along with the 611, 613, some Israelite laws were laws actually from right, the yeah. codes, of, codes of uh Hammurabi and Ur Namu and them. Well, that's another yeah. thing with literalism is that all, all those livid all those Levitical imprecations to uh to stone people, of course, there's no evidence anyone was ever stoned because of these laws. It, it was a, a form of overstatement, kind of. No, in fact, I've I've even spoken to Jews, uh, people who've been to rabbinical school, and they will tell you that uh, under Jewish law, you you never read the stoning instructions uh, literally, yeah, and that an actual stoning was actually pretty rare, which is why, by the way, I've even had Jews agree that uh, even though they don't believe the Jesus stuff, but uh, there's this tale where there there were some people who were going to stone an adulteress, and uh, uh, you know, Jesus said, he "Let him." Was without well, sin cast first in. Yeah, right. And then they all wound up leaving. Well, what a what a Jew who's been to rabbinical school has told me, and another Jewish friend of his agreed is like, uh, Jesus' answer was fundamentally correct because a literal stoning at that time or at any time that they're aware of a literal stoning would have been completely illegal, and those were vigilantes. Mm -hmm. So you know, even learn something about the Jewish religion. Um, they've never read their texts as literally as basically your fundamentalist friends in Appalachia do. Or atheists who often began as, as fundamentalists, yes. Read it exactly the same way, yep. Okay, let me see what I can do here. Let's give them about, well, we are going to run past an hour here, which I don't normally do, but I want to at least get into the stuff on hell. How, how could all those animals fit in the one arc? I should push it forward, you think? Yeah, because oh, he's reading Noah's Ark literally. By the way, uh, you know, historically, most uh, Christian sources I'm aware of uh, think Noah's Ark probably didn't literally go to the top of Mount Everest. That it was more that the biblical writers didn't. They weren't trying to send the message that way. They weren't trying to be that literal. Um, so, but, but uh, the the flood on which the store the flood on which the narrative was based on actually did happen but it wasn't global i'm sure it was but i mean i mean that's a figure of speech we use even today we say it floods the land because because we could still use land interchangeably with earth and so like I'm, the people who lived in people who lived in the persian gulf and mesopotamia samaria that was the world to them at the time just like egypt was its own world china was its own world yeah I mean, I mean, we can use land. We can use land in, in a kind of localized sense even today. So it's it's not a and, and if the Burkle crater theory is to be believed, that it was a meteor that caused the flood in like twenty eight hundred some BC, where uh, not just the Persian Gulf but also parts of India and East Africa were also flooded. So it was a catastrophic deluge of epic proportions, but it didn't flood the entire world. No, no. He has a little thing in here where he talks about how for a while he was calling himself an agnostic because it wasn't safe to call himself an atheist. I'm like, or it wasn't safe yet to use the A word. And I'm like, give me a break. That may be true in some parts of the country, but son, I was an atheist for a long time in places like Chicago and Texas and other world. And uh, 
people might might have found my atheism a little odd, but I was never persecuted. Okay, so maybe you were. I don't know, but have you looked around? Persecuted as a Christian today, yes. Right, and and now you get bashed for being a Christian. Yes. How so you guys won. Now you're in charge, and you get to bully Christians, which happens all the time now. Um, and they laugh at us when we complain about it. By the way, have you have you noticed? All right, so let's see what we got here. You couldn't use the A word back then. There you go. Couldn't use the A word. I yes. think the thing that actually did it for me was just taking the time and sitting down and thinking about the concept of hell. It is the most grotesque, insulting, mind-numbing, ridiculous concept that anybody could ever, ever come up with. But there's this place, okay? If you don't follow a certain rule or pray a certain way to a certain God in a certain manner and say certain things that you go there forever and you burn in pain and agony for eternity. Now, meanwhile, your friends and your family, they may be there with you, but you won't know it. Or they may have done the right things. They'll be in heaven. Okay, but what if I did the right things? And my wife and my kids, they did. They end up in hell. How am I supposed to enjoy eternity? I know that every second of infinity, my wife and my kids are on fire and being tortured by demons. How could I enjoy eternity knowing that anyone is being tortured forever? That's uh, okay. And you know what? I'm going to somewhat, again, give it to him because of his background. Uh, there is a certain strain of Christian who really... That that's a that's a real rough question on because they really do believe that just about everybody's going literally to a fiery tortured hell and I can see why that really upsets uh, some people and I think he even asked a good question there but uh, before I wait in what do you guys say I mean yeah it, it is it is a tough question it's like yeah how 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 can you uh how how can you be comfortable in heaven you know knowing that you know people you loved on earth are in hell. It's not. It's not an easy question, but but I think at that point God's justice will have uh, you know been revealed to you. Well, okay, so I'll get I'll, I'll get more into it. Yeah. The question of salvation and what it looks like and what heaven and hell looks like has been debated among Christians and other religions for thousands of years. It is not true at all that most Christians believe that you know. Uh, <laughs> Oh, everyone's going to hell. Um, the the strongest the word uh, huh? hell. The word for hell, Gehenna, was actually the nearby fiery trash dump they were talking yeah. about. Jesus, um, Jesus compared hell to hell is no more a place of fire and brimstone than heaven is a wedding banquet or a vineyard, which well, he used to talk about heaven and using idioms, which was common. You will get the hardest of hardcore Thomists who will tell you that everybody who does not die per, is not a Roman Catholic who dies faithful in the sacraments is going to hell. Those guys exist. Um, you will find Baptists who uh, are the same way and other fundamentalists who are the same way within their denomination. Uh, I, I, I can only tell you that um, debate, you know, you can, it's real, actually hard to find people who truly believe that and won't back down when you start asking hard questions. And and the orthodox view of all this is so different anyway. I mean, the idea that uh, hell is not uh, hell and heaven are 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 states of existence, right? And most people totally agree that the metaphors of of of, of you know lake of fire and all that uh, are metaphors. Ultimately, hell is the choice to separate yourself eternally from God. And since yes. God is everything that's good. Oh, but atheists um, would choose that option in a heartbeat if it was that simple. Well, that's well, what they say. And, and, and really, if it's what's stopping you, I'm sorry. If the hell thing is what's stopping you, then do some more research digging on the matter. Um, <laughs> there's, uh, most, people, most Christians would probably call, consider universal salvation to be a, a heresy. Um, and it, it's, it ought to be clear to no, most people, uh, well, it, yeah, most, uh, <laughs> universal salvation is unlikely, but, uh, I don't know. There is debate on even that question. 
Um, the bottom line is there's a lot of debate on the question. Um, I know in the tr religious tradition he's from, a lot is put on what they call faith. You know, if you believe in Jesus, you're saved. And if you don't believe, you, you're not saved. And they do quote the appropriate parts of John and, and whatnot that seem to say that. But it all that all ties into what you think the word belief means. Because the way the folks in that part of the country tend to interpret it as, or in those traditions tend to interpret it that is, is how firmly you agree, accept an intellectual proposition. You know, how if I just believe in Jesus harder, I'll be more saved or, or something, right? Or, or, or something. And if I yell it more, it'll be even better, you know? Um, not that I mind a little. Certainly. Not that I mind a little that, really. I, I, really I, I, I mean, but I'm sorry, go ahead. Certainly an all-knowing, all-loving, all-wise God will appreciate what's in people's hearts. Yeah. Yeah. God, God knows your heart better than you know yourself. Better than you know yourself. I mean, I, yeah. I think the point needs to be stressed here, though, that uh, it is a complete non sequitur to say I have a problem with this doctrine of hell, or I, I have a problem with this or that doctrine in general, and then say therefore atheism. That that is a drastic move because it doesn't follow at all that okay I have a problem with this or that uh, doctrine of this denomination, therefore atheism. Uh, that seems just just uh, an excessive, just drastic move, and it does not logically follow. If nothing else, just default to generic theism, and and, and work it out from there. But but I almost think a lot of these people who who say I have a problem with this, therefore atheism, it's because they actually just want to be atheists, because well, it, me, it's such an unwarranted move. Let me put it to you this way. Among spiritual traditions, there's not that many variations when you get right down to it. First, there's the atheist tradition. And by the way, it is one uh, with a pedigree going back thousands of years, which just kind of assumes what, what we're animals and we're going to, you know, rot out and disappear and snuff like candles. And that's all there is to it. OK, that's one view. All right. Then there's another view that we're on this kind of wheel of constant uh, uh, reincarnation. Um, maybe going up or down, depending on our karma, uh, uh, which is actually a pretty shitty deal if you think about it. If, you know, life is full of pain and agony and suffering and disappointment and heartbreak and bitterness and horrible pain and abuse and betrayal, and you just have to keep living through that, through life after life after horrible life after horrible life. Or there's the idea that one way or the other, you have an ultimate destination, and the ultimate destination will be based on your choices and what you most want, um, you know, towards all that is good or not. Uh, which is actually the more horrifying? Which is actually the most horrifying to contemplate? And well, I want to push through the rest of the video. Ultimate destination, yeah. Uh, I would also point out that while, while we're here. Uh, a book called God in the Afterlife, which I think is worth looking at, um, which is fairly wanna, up to date on the... Huh? You want to push through the rest of the video? Well, I just want to... Well, okay, I guess. I'm actually wondering if we should just stop here. I'm not sure he's got more. There's, a, there's a little more left. There's just a little more left. All right. I will point out this book, God in the Afterlife, which, will, which affirms, by the way, in near-death experiences, a minority but a significant number do report uh, a, a condition or state or hell and warning people you don't want to go there. Yes. Scientific data. And, and by the way, it's the data does not appear to be religion dependent, which is yeah. you know, troubling to some Christians, but whatever. Just might want to look at it. All right, let's see. What I, I, I think it's worth pointing out that every argument this guy has used so far is a seems to me argument. It's like, I don't like this idea. Therefore, I'm just going to reject it. Well, That's exactly. It's like, okay, and it's, exactly. Look, if there is a higher and a lower existence, a heaven, a hell, whatever, uh, there's disturbing implications to that, but there's disturbing implications to reincarnation, and there's disturbing implications to the idea that we all just rot out and, and die and stuff like a candle. So not liking an idea is not a good enough reason to say, well, wh what's the reality? So there we go. All right, let's see if we can just push through to the end of this. Have you ever noticed hell's not in the Old Testament? Gentle Jesus, meek and mild, shows up, and it's then and there we are threatened with eternal suffering. 
WWJD indeed. So I look back on the whole concept of religion. I knew I was already an atheist about a law. I know I didn't believe in Shiva and Ganesh and all the other Hindu gods. Zeus, Poseidon, Thor, Ra, they no longer had millions of followers. Those gods had long since gone to that mass graveyard we call mythology. So I just went one god more. And I got to tell you, it was a great feeling. But it wasn't a change that came overnight. It was just little bits and pieces that happened over the course of several years. And I am a totally happy person. I'm a totally moral person. Really, really. I've got a great family. I've got a great job. I can do these videos for one thing every once in a while. I donate to charities. I push my shopping carts back where they're supposed to go in parking lots. I my wife. I, I, I like I, 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 worrying about what's going to come next. Yeah. That's probably the best thing that came out of all this. Mm -hmm. I can enjoy the here and the now. Every moment's great. The universe is going to continue on for billions and billions of years. I only get to be here. How do you be so sure? Very small part of that. And that is great. I am so lucky to be here. Okay. I look back on my childhood with a smile. And I still, every once in a while, I'll read the Bible. I'm actually pretty daggone familiar with it. I just look at it as a history book written by men who are trying to figure out their place in the world. Not as a guide how to live. Not as the end all and be all of human existence. It's a book. And it goes on the shelf with other books. Okay, well, like I said, it's this is far from the worst atheist video I've ever seen. Uh, I think he's genuine, pretty genuine, and he's just suffering from a lack of education, and that might upset him, but it, it's just but true. Jesus did not invent hell. The hell, concept of hell is in nearly every mythology. I'm afraid it is. That's another thing that people need to figure out. Uh, the concept of hell predates Christianity. It is not mentioned in uh, the Old Testament specifically, although it's hinted to and alluded to. Uh, it is not true that the Jews have no concept of hell. Contemporary Judaism doesn't uh, really sit well with the idea of heaven and hell because their whole idea of the afterlife is, let's just say, more ambiguous. Um, uh, uh, but they know that people are going to be facing justice. That's what they believe. The people will be, you know, people will face justice for their sins in the afterlife. They believe that. And if you look, uh, hell was an ex extant belief among Roman pagans, among and, and among quite a few other religions. It appears that people naturally develop a belief in something like hell um, and in something like heaven. They tend to naturally develop that belief. It's found in every culture. It is not an invention of, of the Christians. In every culture, is uh, heaven is universal also among cultures. Yes. That's right. Most either go in for the whole cycle of, of, of reincarnation sort of spirituality and maybe moving to higher or lower physical, you know, uh, uh, planes of existence. Um, or, and, they'll but, say, um, and they'll say purgatory is a Catholic invention, although that's pretty universal. Also, it's not yeah. as quite as common as heaven and hell, but they're in other yeah. faiths and beliefs. Yeah. Purgatory is actually not just a Catholic thing, at least if you take away the word purgatory. Because <laughs> a lot of people fight it just because they don't like the word. For example, the Eastern yes. Orthodox don't believe, they'll tell you they don't believe in purgatory. But in, then in between you border them, dimension. It, uh, what they believe in is a state between heaven and hell. <laughs> like, okay, okay. They, they basically agree that there's something like purgatory. Um, and there's quite a few other uh, Christian traditions that do. So it's not true that Catholics invented that one either. Uh, and you're right. It is found in other religious traditions that, like, you know, we'll go and then we will be paying off the debts of sin that we owe. And then we'll go on to whatever's better. It's either that or you get the more rude, rough idea, like, say, of the pagans that, you know, once you're in hell, that's it. You're in Hades forever and, and, and giving whatever torment you're given. And I do know a lot of people get psychologically traumatized, especially as children, by being threatened with hell. So, I mean, I, I, I know that that is a root cause of some 
uh, atheist distress because they wind up in this place where they, they hate a God who would do that to anybody. And so I get that objection. I do. I just think that if you look into it, look, you find out that ideas of salvation are much more complicated than that uh, and subtle. I'm sorry, what? No, I forgot what I was going to say. Yeah. But I mean, if there is an ultimate destination. Oh, how oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That, um, that I just go one God further argument oh, as if God itself is God even further. remotely comparable to the pagan gods. No, it's really not. It's it's insulting to the pagans. Uh, it, it, it's they're just uh, they're just their gods were just pathetic material beings who would still be reliant upon God itself. Well, yeah, I mean it's a little more tricky than that, but yeah, because yeah, let's. Get, I've mentioned this a few times. I'll mention it again. Um, the Stoic religion and other uh, uh, you know others who were into like Zeus and Apollo and all that. Uh, the sophisticated ones believed that Zeus was actually the prime mover uh, described by Aristotle, that, you know, that Zeus was timeless, beyond time, beyond space, and in control of everything. Um, Same with certain Norse, Norse I, people and how they pictured Odin. Yeah, and, that, and they very and much the saw the, they saw the, they, they believed he, would, he had no body, but that he might physically and manifest. And the Egyptians one. with the, um, the Egyptians, how they saw Aten, you know, yeah. that, uh, that monotheism that was very temporary. The uh, Yeah, monotheism is ex an extremely common idea. And indeed, there is a reason to believe monotheism is older than polytheism is. Mm. Um, and that it is more common than polytheism. And, oh, and also, most polytheists wind up with a monotheist root. Eventually, when you Hindus have a monotheist buried at the idea at the very bottom of their supposed millions of gods, there is the Brahma, who is the great Brahman. mind, Brahman that, that 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 is the great mind that dreams the universe, and the entire universe is in the Brahma's dream. And, and um, we, we could we could go uh, an entire hangout just attacking the one god further argument on philosophical grounds. I think. On historical grounds, there's a much more succinct argument to be made that if they're saying that monotheism is just kind of the terminus of, of, of all these other polytheisms, and that's bound for extinction too, we could simply point out that monotheism has at least a 3,000-year tradition, and many of those pagan gods have come and gone in those 3,000 years. Yeah. So, I mean, you can't just say this. This is the this is the you know latest. This is the latest uh, uh, kind of version of, of of polytheism, and it's just bound for the trash heap of history. No, because monotheism has already proven itself uh, uh, against everything else. Yeah, and there's abundant evidence for a monotheist universe uh, run universe. There just yes. is, even in contemporary science. He ought to know this. If he doesn't, you know, I'm saying it's something worth knowing. Um, and there's those who say that the, the fallen angels referenced in the, the book of Enoch were the, like the progenitors of the pagan gods. Right. That, um, yeah. But and, and again, I, I give, I give, I, I, I gotta keep insisting. People gotta give the pagans a little more sense for sophistication. Like I said, like I was saying about Zeus, they believed he was the, you know, beyond time, beyond space, controller of everything. Um, but he would take human form, and a lot, and the statues and the drawings they knew were representative and symbolic. But he might take human form. They knew, they knew, they thought that would happen sometimes, but they didn't. But they, but they thought of him as something much bigger. And the other gods would. Almost be like you know Christians talk about angels because you know Zeus was the All Father and therefore the creator of everything, and then the other gods like you would, you know, you would have a great spirit running, you know, they would draw Apollo as as you know riding a chariot across the skies, but they didn't necessarily take that literally either. You talk to sophisticated pagans now and they'll be like, oh yeah, Thor. Thor is basically uh, the spirit of weather in general. And he may or may not take human form, but you know, ultimately, he's weather more or less. Uh, so it, it, they're not that unsophisticated. They, really not. They, they compare they compare God itself to the other gods, even though they all had limited attributes, a certain power. They ruled a certain region in the world and were born yes. of higher beings, who themselves were born of higher beings, to look like humans, look like animals, sometimes both. 
but there was an unmoved mover, an uncreated. And we're, and we're all male, and, and we're all either male or female. Yeah. Yep. To believe that again, the the idea of the unmoved mover, the uncreated creator, the the alpha and the omega is actually found in many of these other religions. You mentioned so, the Bantu uh, tradition going back ten thousand years. I think nine thousand is what I read. Yeah, uh, there's a there's a book you can read by a guy named Pasito Tempels about it. I, I don't have it right now, but I would actually uh, I would but, I would argue like fifty thousand years because that's probably the time Adam and Eve lived. If you look at the data I just mentioned, Jared Barrett and that book, Born Believers, I'll tell you, children naturally develop a sense that something intelligent is running and controlling the universe and become curious about it on their own. And they can distinguish that feeling that something is running everything from any of those other, uh, you know, Santa Claus, whatever. In other words, we're born to sort of seek this spiritual thing. We obviously evolved that trait. Some children lack it, mostly autistics. Um, but yeah, uh, it's, it is a natural evolved trait to seek this thing and you've got no right to call it a delusion. Now, maybe you got some people who read the Bible like an idiot or have just always read it primitive and never gone beyond a primitive read. I don't know, but. Oh, but then, you know, people had it wrong until the atheists came along. You know, the atheists came along and made it safe for us to be atheism again. You know, just like the feminists came along and made it safe to be a woman, finally. The atheists came along and made it safe to be atheists, supposedly. Uh, that narrative just evidence. so needs to They gave us um, evidence and reason and logic. Whereas yeah. people just automatically believed anything they were told until the atheists came along. I mean... How did Bertrand Russell ever get published if it was not safe to be an atheist? How did Nietzsche get published? How did the Marquis de Sade get published? How did how did David Hume get if, published? How if, did Sartre get you, published? How do you think uh, how, how do you think how Nietzsche or, or Sartre? Huh? How do you think Nietzsche or Sartre react if they saw the anti-theists of today? They, they would probably never stop puking. Yeah, I, th I think I think Nietzsche would literally commit suicide or become a Catholic monk. Yeah, or or laugh, or laugh himself to death after reading the God Delusion and God is Not Great and all those yeah. propaganda books. I think Nietzsche would probably want to physically assault Richard Dawkins. I really do. And I especially, especially Carrier and Aaron Raw. I, I will totally give it to you that Nietzsche was smart and he really thought his stuff through and he had. And the, in fact, the whole atheist victim narrative has to be the worst thing. Now, no, I do get it for the people who were abused as children. Just remember, secularists abuse children too. Uh, <laughs> and I got some stories to tell you about a school teacher who had an interest. Uh, in oh, me. but but a uh, godless man-child engineer thinks the Catholic Church has a monopoly on pedophilia. I, well, I tell you what, we do have a pedo problem. We seem to have mostly cleaned it in the U.S. mostly, but. Uh, that actually all relates to communist entryists going back into the 1960s and 1970s, and we're going to be cleaning that mess out. Um, a much bigger so pedo. Much elaborate conspiracy theories, Max. <laughs> well, but you look at the well, just look at what what Michael Voris is doing. Um, you know, exposing the problem and calling out the Vatican. There has been some terrible sex stuff going on in the Vatican. I I really think that Catholics are going to be needing to buckle down for a bad scandal coming out of the Vatican. Um, and I'm not the only Catholic who thinks that. Is that the church militant? Oh, you look at the stuff from church militant. Also look at something, a guy called Tradcat Knight. Now he's pretty hardcore conservative Catholic, uh, but uh, there's a lot of data about, yeah, there is a pedo scandal in the church and we seem to have mostly cleaned it up in the U S but not internationally. And that's just, but, but that did come from entryists in the church who literally came in with the intent of doing that stuff. So they're going to get cleaned out in the meantime, look at Hollywood, look at Washington, DC, look at the public school system, which is rife with pedo. And yes. tell me uniquely, you need uh, look at that. Look at the prison system, the juvenile prison system. Oh, oh my at, God. So with pedos. Secular private academies that have every bit as much of, of a sex scandal problem as, as the Catholic Church ever had. That's right. Everybody's got a pedo problem. You've got a bigotry problem if you only can uh, focus on the Catholics. And Catholics got a right to push back on that. Besides, 
Catholics are actually trying to do something about it. What is the atheist community doing to clean up pedos everywhere in the secular system? Because it's demonstrable that the secular, uh, uh, you know, government-run schools and other facilities have a bigger problem. Um, <laughs> I made a discovery this last week. Talk to me about the Catholic hating pedo who came after me when I was 13 in the public school system and his cop wife and his buddy who worked at the, at the city transit system where they would like to collect wayward kids at the public school and the bus stations and the train stations. Um, you know, ugh, yeah, but that, I'm sorry. Now we're, we're getting off on godless engineers rant. Uh, and uh, this is not, uh, uh, we've been talking about Axel. Oh, I'm sorry. What's he called again? Ax. Oh, 43. Alley. 43. Alley. I kept calling him Axel. I think I apologize. Yeah. He, he I, I didn't mean to, we just got dragged in by a commenter on that one. Um, the bottom th thing I would say to 43 Alley here is he should look at just how hateful the atheist movement has become since he made this video almost eight years ago. That's it is an older video, popular one somewhat. But uh, it's again, I think he actually got caught up in something, something that was popular. And uh, I, I wouldn't even be surprised if the cognitive dissonance is caught up with him. Like even if he's still not religious, he's probably noticed there just ain't much to say about atheism and atheism didn't do anything to make much better i don't think he's been on youtube for some time his last video was seven months ago but you know uh i would say to him have you ever been rethinking that like really um i would hope he would think about just how ugly nasty and abusive the atheists are in social media and on youtube because they're incredibly nasty um, they've harassed and hurt a lot of people, and we can bring you eyewitnesses on that, uh, specifically for the crime of being religious. You know, only atheists run in groups to harass Christians that I can find on social media. And I, I, I'm sorry, when I hear about supposed Christian uh, harassment, I'm the only one I know of who does anything that could be called that. Well, me and deflating. And even then, we usually don't go after people who haven't yeah, already no, published works. something nasty who have yeah we're, we're usually responding to something far nastier than we're actually saying and there, there's a reason both of us are anonymous so well that's right there's a reason most of the red pill religion team is anonymous i can't i'm actually not anonymous uh, in fact uh, the, the atheists go out of their way to use my legal name as as much as they can because they know it that makes it turns up in search terms and so they. Hey, they Dean. What you doing, Dean? You on your meds, Dean? That's What's another wrong, reason? Dean. That's, that's another. Yeah, and that's a psychological technique that actually is known to be a way you abuse somebody. I mean, they teach that to you in schools on how to torture and, and dominate and manipulate people is to use their name over and over again like that. Plus, they know it shows up in search terms. So every nasty thing they say. You know, that's the first thing you find when you put the Dean Esme into search terms. And most of it's garbage, right? Quoted out of context, uh, quoted, uh, you know, quote mind, basically. So you take the context out or you'll say something true, but you leave out exculpatory information, which is another good way of lying. I got lies from, uh, from me all over the place written uh, on the Internet uh, by angry atheists who aren't being honest, angry feminists who aren't being honest. And, uh, you know, a few, a few wealthy moneyed interests I, I offended back 10 plus years ago when I was doing journalism work, uh, investigating the pharmaceutical companies where they start. Then, then they started smearing me as an AIDS denialist and uh, anti-gay, which was always just garbage. Um, uh, but, you know, when you go up against powerful drug companies, they, they, they smear you and make up lies about you. So they like using the name, and they do that to other people too, specifically so they know your name will come up in search engines. Employers will look for your name, and they'll search on the internet to see anything about you, so you can lose jobs because of that. Mm -hmm. um, and again, they smear your reputation and say things that are half-truths and thus gossip all over the place, and I'm not their only victim. This is why I do advise people to, to be anonymous, at least until this stuff gets exposed, because... When you see people being doxxed like that and see uh, uh, smearing campaigns like that going on, they almost always go to uh, skeptic atheist groups. They really like because people who are call themselves skeptics like doing that kind of work. You know, they do. Just look at the Candid Affair. Just look at what uh, C.J. Worleman has exposed Sam Harris is doing. <laughs> you know, the bottom line is is that. 
these these folks have turned into something horrible, hateful, and nasty. Although I will say again too, it's changing. It's changing. I think uh, most of the political impetus behind atheism was from like, um, to be honest, I think it was from leftist social justice forces that were pushing atheism as their as their central narrative. And, th and that's why so many of these young atheists really do seem to think they're in a victim group because they're atheists. Mm. Um, I, I, well, I'm we are victims, Dean. Why are you making fun of us, Dean? You, you should. Yeah, right. You should be medicated and and not on YouTube, Dean. Med medicated out of your faith, like 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 Peter Bogosian says. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I would actually ask, you know. Uh, uh, a 43 alley here. Do you actually go with these atheists who talk about taking people's children away for teaching them their religion? Uh, who talk about medicating people and putting them in asylums, um, uh, denying them job opportunities because of that? Because all that stuff's happening now. Um, and so, you know, anyway. Uh, Oh, as for the Dean thing, yeah, that's my legal name. But I, my friends call me Max. My enemies call me Dean. You decide which one you want to use. <laughs> the, 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 again, this is not for Axel. But I would, I would ask him though. I mean, did he, has he noticed yet? What a seedy, nasty, filthy cult of bigots and bullies and scientific and historic ignorant ignoramuses typify the the standard YouTube atheist today. I mean. Look at Godless Engineer. I know I was mean to the guy, but I was dealing with someone who was truly acting like an obnoxious bigot and bully. And he's not alone in some in, 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 among the people who act that way. That was T.J. Kirk's whole stick, being a really hateful bully. Oh well, yeah, um, he's he's taking up T.J.'s mantle apparently. I oh, has he not this guy? No, Godless Engineer. Godless engineer. Oh, he's taking up TJ's mantle. Yeah, it's not going to work. It's not going to work, but he can whining, try. Whining man child who thinks he's smarter than everybody else in the world. TJ had help. Okay, he got. He, you know, he had. A, he had publicity people, uh, mostly from the political left, help make him a thing and get him on CNN and get it. You know, kind of make him a. He was a somewhat manufactured celebrity, and he knows it. He wasn't grassroots anything. Uh, just like Anita Sarkeesian wasn't grassroots, Lacey Green's not grassroots. You know, uh, they're those. all creation. They're all media creations. Um, just like Sam Harris is a media creature. Yeah. You know, and Hitchens. Uh, they 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 got you know they got money and they got you know um, all kinds of boosts and subscribership and 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 Google and YouTube are, are Christian hostile environments. They just, and, and everybody's known that in the Christian community for years. Um, so yeah, I'd like to know if he has any knowledge in any of that or if any of that's ever bothered him because holy cow, I, I remember starting being sympathetic to the atheist thing. And then the more I encountered it and the more I got abused, I got abused quite a bit and they say, we, we, you didn't get abused. Yeah, I did. And so did a lot of people I talked to, uh, atheists are just extraordinary abusive bullies on online. Uh, they just typically are, and it's most of them. Um, it's just what I see. Not this guy, though. I like. I was okay with this guy. I understood this guy. I thought like him at one time. So you know, uh, he's what I would call a type one atheist. You know, the one who just doesn't get it. Um, the type two atheist are these ideologues I'm talking about. He looks like a type one who just kind of got swept up in some of the atheist propaganda. Yeah. Uh, so all right. Anybody got anything else to say? I think we should wrap it up. All right. Again, we're going to see Andrew and the other and some others come on in to talk about ethics in, a, in, a, in within a half hour, I believe. So everybody, stay tuned. Thanks for, to Liz and uh, White Engine for joining us. Everybody, check out Deflating Atheism. Please give us a like. Please give us a subscribe. Please tell your friends or enemies. And God bless. God bless. God bless. <laughs>